My name is uh, Dan Lambright, and I work for Red Hat. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about Gluster. Um, I'm filling in for a guy named John Mark Walker, who's the chief evangelist of, uh, of Gluster. Uh, I'm a developer, uh, and this was kind of at the last minute. So the point of view that I'm going to be giving you is more from a community member, uh, coder uh, perspective and point of view, and a little bit less of a marketing point of view. And uh, as a consequence, this may seem a wee bit less polished, um, but a little more heavy on the technical side, which I hope, I hope is a good thing. So um, what I will do is uh, tr uh, discuss why Gluster FS is a good choice for cloud storage. The arguments that I'm gonna give you are gonna be very similar to what you've heard in the last two sessions, uh, particularly the Ceph session. Um, the uh, main reason is uh, scalability. Um, I'll go a little bit in, uh, with a technology overview of ClusterFS. I'll uh, explain how it works uh, internally. Talk about the cloud use case. Again, this will be very similar to what you've seen in the other two uh, presentations from SolidFire and Ceph. Um, talk about our integration. Again, it's gonna be a very similar story. There's a cloud and then there's a back end and the back end talks directly to Gluster as it does for Ceph with its RBD uh, interface. Um, and the story is very similar for all the open source clouds, that is OpenStack, Zen, and uh, this one, uh, CloudStack. A uh, little different for the private clouds or the uh, closed source clouds. Um, and uh, I'll go talk a little bit about those. iSCSI is uh, the fallback, so to speak. And I'll talk about the differences between when you would have to use iSCSI, you probably prefer not to for reasons I'll go into, and uh, uh, these uh, deeper integrations, which I'll talk about, that are faster, better, and have all the features of the backend storage. Then I'll talk a little bit about the future of Gluster. So, uh, a distributed storage system gives you linear scaling. That's why you use it. Uh, that's good for a cloud because as you add virtual machines, and more virtual machines you have, the more storage you need, you want to incrementally add or remove storage. That's why a distributed storage system is possibly a good choice for you. Why ClusterFS in particular? Um, well, it's open source. It's free. You can download it, use it. Uh, it has a large community, very active community. All around the world, people are 24 hours a day developing code for, for this. And they're passionate about it. Um, and uh, that's a plus because we get features on a continuous basis. Um, runs on commodity hardware. A great point made in the last session had to do with erasure codes and triplication, which is three-way replication. Cluster's coming out with uh, that as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the bottom line is, it works with commodity hardware. Just like the points made earlier, you don't need to buy some fancy EMC thing uh, or NetApp thing or what have you. Uh, it's simple to work with. I'll have a few slides where I go through how to set it up. Um, it's, it is cheap. Part of Red Hat storage, that basically means it is production ready. You can use it now. We'll back you with uh, uh, service, support, et cetera. Uh, there is a subscription model that would provide you this. Or you can just download it and use it. Um, join the uh, mailing list, talk to people, ask questions. They'll help you. Um, the community is what you get with open source as opposed to an EMC. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm not going to the next slide here. Can you help me why I'm not going to the next slide? Uh, it works now, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry to keep bugging that guy. Oh well. Uh, all right. So um, the scale up story I think is of no surprise here and actually I could probably skip this slide. But there, are, as has been pointed out, two ways you can scale. You can scale up horizontally or vertically. Scaling vertic vertically just means that you add more disks to a singular node. This is a distributed system, so we're talking about multiple nodes. You can grow a particular node or you can add other nodes. 
Scaling out is adding other nodes. Um, we call um, the storage units inside the node, we call them in cluster terminology, we call them bricks. Uh, so adding another disk to a node is adding a brick. Um, this little animation just depicts that um, as you add scale out, as you add nodes, your capacity and your performance scales linearly. Scaling linearly is a really big deal. It's hard to scale linearly because as your cluster grows, you may, for various reasons internal to the system, have to have, you have more trouble uh, working with a cluster. You might have multicasts uh, to every node in the cluster, et cetera. So it's a technical achievement to be able to scale linearly. We think we can up to a point. Um, the largest uh, cluster size that I know of is uh, 100. Um, that's the largest I've seen. Um, so uh, next few slides are gonna be a brief technology overview um, with some terms. Uh, a peer is a node inside of a cluster that cluster uses. Uh, peers are trusted. That means no node can just join willy-nilly into a cluster. It has to be invited into it, and there's a security model and a security arrangement to make that happen. A brick, like I said, is physical storage. It's a disk or SSD or whatever. Um, Gluster sits on top of all that stuff, so it actually doesn't know what physical storage is underneath. You could use an SSD. We've tested with SSDs. We've seen good performance with SSDs. Uh, and uh, as far as Gluster con is concerned, it's just another underlying storage unit. Um, volume is the logical uh, uh, abstraction that's, that's uh, user-facing. It's an aggregation of bricks. These bricks may reside on different nodes. So you may, for example, have a volume composed of 10 different disks spread across 10 different nodes. These volumes can have different attributes. Um, I listed a few here, distributed, replicated, striped, um, soon erasure codes, um, and I'll talk a few in the next few slides about some of those different types. Um, a translator, so Gluster is a modular system, a modular meaning, Community members can add new functionality at the unit of a module. This module is called a translator. It's a IO stack, a stack of translators. I'll have a slide that depicts that in a moment. Gluster lives entirely in user space. Uh, unlike Ceph, uh, this has performance implications in some various cases, but it resides entirely in user space. It's actually written in C. Uh, the two demons that I'll point out to you that run Gluster are the management daemon, the first one there you see, and the data path daemon. There's one of those for each volume. Access protocols. Like Ceph, we support many different access protocols. Um, you can mount a Gluster volume on a client, like any other file system. And if you do so, you can touch that file system the same way you would any other using Linux API, POSIX. I said there's nothing in the kernel. So what happens when you do a syscall into the kernel? Well, a fuse interface jumps back up into those demons that I mentioned. So we use fuse for that. Fuse has a performance uh, implication. I'll talk about that in a moment in relation to the cloud, which, where you would like to avoid that. We also support NFS, uh, Samba, um, so Microsoft. Uh, Swift, I, I don't believe we support S3, um, and distributed block storage, uh, I'll talk about that shortly, uh, which is relevant to the cloud. A distributed volume, okay, so um, let's say you have 10 nodes. Let's say you create a file. You wanna use these nodes capacity evenly, equally, so that when you add files, each node slowly gets used. And it's, so what the, a distributed volume means that a random node, semi-random node, will be chosen to take that file, to store that file. Uh, how is that chosen? It's actually very similar to the uh, 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 hashing algorithm that you saw that Ceph uses. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but that's basically how it works. So 
slowly all these nodes will get used uh, equally. The problem there, of course, is what happens if a node dies. It would be catastrophic. Uh, so we have replicated volumes. Uh, you can do three-way replication, which is, of course, a 200% uh, overhead of uh, uh, storage. Um, or you could do uh, underneath the, uh, 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 you could have RAID 6, like a controller, a RAID 6 controller. Um, you can, this is a property that you give to a volume, the number of replications of a particular file that across different nodes. There's also striping, so you can stripe data across different nodes. But at the file level, we've seen uh, uh, very good results. Um, this next two slides are just a quick depiction of how simple it is to set up Gluster. Um, the first uh, five lines there are how to set up a brick. And there's nothing Gluster there. It's just creating a, taking a block device and and formatting XFS on top of it. Uh, we like XFS because it seems to be the most reliable and fastest at the moment. Maybe another file system like ButterFS will come along and that will become our new choice. At the moment, it's XFS as a, as a choice, but actually you could use whatever you want. Gluster doesn't care what file system you use. Then uh, after you've got your brick, uh, you start up the uh, daemon. Uh, this is the management daemon. I've started up there. That's the bottom most line. Now we're uh, uh, in this, the top plane there, pane there, is a few commands that show how the uh, cluster is created. Basically, you have one node invite another node to join the cluster. And that's what this command peer probe does. Uh, cluster, uh, that's the CLI. And we're just saying join our cluster. And uh, we have three uh, servers which have joined in this example. Next, on the bottom, uh, a distributed volume is being created. You give the name of the volume, volume create, the name, and then a list. The list is servers, uh, 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 topo servers and bricks. You tell the server the name of the node and the brick on that node. You make a list of those, and that's your volume. Um, and then in the last uh, command on the very bottom there, on the, that could be on the client, uh, where you're saying, okay, I want to mount this Gluster uh, volume. I want to access it now. Notice I'm just say, giving a single server there. When I give that single server, all the servers in that volume group are suddenly active. And when I write to that file system, that file, because it's a distributed one, will end up on one of those nodes. Again, this is very similar to Ceph and maybe some other things you've seen. So let's talk about some Gluster internals. This is a place where it differs from Ceph. There's no metadata server. Every node is exactly the same. This has some interesting uh, implications. Um, there's uh, no, uh, one, for a system administrator, there's no overhead, management overhead of maintaining a metadata server. You don't have to go out there and create it. You don't have to have any kind of uh, uh, redundancy amongst the metadata servers. So if one with a proxy, al proxy algorithm or something, so if one goes down, the other one takes over or anything like that. Um, all nodes are the same in Gluster. Um, and uh, so how uh, do you know where a file exists? In this sense, uh, it's like what you just heard in the last presentation. There is a hash on the path and file name which results in a node identifier. So uh, we simply um, run the hash, and that hash tells you where the, uh, where the file will reside. Um, the um, the uh, uh, interesting thing there is uh, what happens if a node comes and goes? Well, the data has to be uh, reorganized to account for that, and that's a slow process. So that's perhaps a downside to this kind of implementation. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, set, uh, uh, the uh, Gluster is an aggregator of file systems, basically. It's a user space thing which doesn't know what is underneath. Um, another interesting property with Gluster is that everything is stored as files um, uh, for the most part. There's an exception that has to do with block devices, which I can get to later. But, uh, 
objects and files are just files in XFS. So if you're a system administrator and you're, you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, something went wrong and I, or I've got to uh, check out what these files look like, I've got to manipulate and touch and feel what's, what's going on here. Well, if you look at what Gluster wrote, actually wrote to the XFS file system, it'll be relatively simple to look, read and understand. It won't be uh, in some mangled or marshaled format. So that, that's, that's a, a nice thing, I think. Um, here's a, a depiction of what are the translators. Um, so these are stacks of functionalities, storage stacks of I.O. functionality. Uh, on the right side, the blue stack is what is running on the client. So this is a whole lot of functionality that's running on the client. Uh, and uh, there's various things there. There's a prefetch algorithm, there's a cache, and on the left side, there's some more stuff. This is, uh, this is uh, what's running on the server. Now, a community member can come along and introduce some new functionality, and all they have to do is understand the hooks at that level and that level, and it can basically insert cleanly in there. And this makes it very easy for community members to sort of just jump in. It's not so much a monolithic chunk of code. It's more of a, a modular uh, chunk <laughs> uh, setup organization. So um, I, maybe some of you said there, well, wait a minute, this is running on the client. What if I'm running on the, uh, running, what if I'm running Windows and I want to use Gluster? I'll get to that in just a moment, but if you do run Gluster on your client, and as a cloud uh, uh, practitioner, you, that's how you would want to do it, I think. Well, the advantage to running Gluster on your client is you get this fan out activity. In other words, I can directly send I, uh, my I.O. for a particular file directly, I can send that directly to the node in question. If he lives on the bottom node, then I send the I.O. directly to there. Um, that's nice and fast, um, but there are use cases where you cannot run Gluster on the client. Let's say it's a closed system. Let's say it's like Windows. Um, in that case, uh, we can, you can run Gluster entirely on the server, and it will listen for NFS, or it will listen for Samba, or iSCSI. And the only downside, really, is that you have a single pipe in the Gluster, and you don't get that fan out, that load balancing, or that uh, uh, extra performance. Um, uh, okay, so that, that's, so it's possible to do, but if you can avoid that, it's, it's probably better. Okay, so um, we've talked about Gluster up till now. Let's talk about cloud. Um, as I said, cloud storage must scale. So um, we uh, actually at, at Red Hat, um, it's OpenStack is kind of the, a lot of where a lot of development efforts have, have gone. And uh, I've, I've seen a lot of VMs attached to clusters. Uh, I'll, I'll run a command Nova list, and I'll just see pa page after page of VMs that have been created and are actually running right now on Gluster. So that works, and, and it's been demonstrated. Um, the access patterns uh, for, this, uh, for virtual machines, well, it's, these are images. They're just they're images, and, and, and they're doing SCSI commands, blocks to access what they think, for all intents and purposes for them, the virtual machine, is a disk. So they'll run a SCSI command, read, write. And, uh, and oftentimes, we see random I.O. Even at, at perhaps at the level of the virtual machine, it might be random. Or when you have a, a big aggregation of lots of virtual machines running inside the cloud, the result, the, the funnels through, looks pretty darn random. So you got a lot of random I.O. with the cloud. Um, so um, that's, that's the sort of the pattern that, that, that you see with the cloud use case using Gluster. Um, the next few slides are a bit more about integration. Um, so uh, integrating uh, with the cloud, what does this mean exactly? It basically means a SCSI command has to go to Gluster. Um, now, I mentioned a moment ago that 
Gluster can support iSCSI. Um, and why would that be not the greatest way to go? Well, that goes back to that fan out uh, uh, diagram that I showed you a few slides ago. That would be a single pipe from the cloud over iSCSI to Gluster. Um, preferably, you would want to run Gluster on the client. Um, this is where the integration can come in. So for CloudStack, we already have a hook to do this integration that I just mentioned in the li a library called libvirt. We did this for OpenStack, but CloudStack also uses this library, so it can enjoy that benefit as well. Um, so the available support for CloudStack was, in a sense, already there, sort of waiting to be used. The only missing piece was a little bit of Java code, which a community member, Niels DeVos, wrote. This Java code uh, opened up that feature in the libvirt uh, library and said, here's another volume type you can use. It's called the Gluster volume type. You can create it, and you can use this volume and add it to your images. So this was a pretty relatively simple job uh, from the development point of view. The two points in the middle there uh, have to do with the data path and the control path. The data path being I.O. reads and writes, the control path being management, create volumes, uh, take a snap of a volume. Um, I mentioned we use Fuse in some cases. Fuse means you go to the kernel and bounce back up to user space, and it's a bit slow. Well, the only point here being is that that's only used for the management path. The slow, that slow I.O. path um, is only um, used for management cases. The data path, that is the SCSI commands, meaning a SCSI read, a SCSI write, gets piped down, it reaches libvirt, we capture that, and we turn that into a read or a write over the Gluster protocol to the Gluster server. That has to be fast, and it, and it is fast, um, using this uh, deeper integration. That's what was already in the libvirt. So that's what we've done for Cloud Stack, and it should be in 4.4. I think that it's already been accepted. Uh, these next two paint are just example uh, of what it looks like. Uh, you can just see that a Gluster is one of the options for your volume when you create it. And here's an already made volume, and you can see it's of type Gluster. Um, other clouds, okay. As I mentioned, OpenStack already has this hook, the hook that converts SCSI commands to the Gluster protocol. That's already in OpenStack. What about the others, other clouds, like Zen? Well, Zen doesn't, as far as I know, and I may be wrong, does not use libvirt. Therefore, it needs its own work, which is a little deeper, a little harder. Um, at least it's open source. Um, Hyper-V, VMware, VirtualBox are closed source. What can they do? They won't run Gluster, as, at least there might be a way to do it, but, but uh, the default way is to use iSCSI for those guys. So if you need block access and you can't get the deeper integration, yes, you can use iSCSI with, with Gluster. There's a daemon uh, that was mentioned in the previous lecture called TGT, target daemon. It, it's a, it understands iSCSI. It reads, it gets iSCSI, and then it turns around and says, does something with it. What does it do with it? You decide. It's a back-end plug-in that you plug into the target daemon. I wrote a backend for Gluster, which was accepted upstream, and it basically takes the SCSI command and then writes it to Gluster. Um, target daemon is uh, probably going to get replaced by something called LIO, for your information. Um, Linux is always changing, and the same job will have to be done for, for that. LIO lives in the kernel. Target daemon, as the name implies, is a Linux service. What is, uh, I said earlier that in Gluster, everything is a file. In other words, we're working on files. So there's a, uh, an idiom in the storage world called block over file. And all this is, is you take a large file, 
create a large file, and that's your LUN. And then the block is a offset in that file. End of story. Very simple. Um, of course, you have the overhead of the file system where you would not have had it before. So inside of Gluster, there is a special type of volume which you can create called a block device file, and that skips the file system overhead. In other words, there's no XFS there. Okay, um, I see I have only one minute left, and I'd like to get some questions, so I'll just skip right to the future. Um, we're doing erasure codes as well. It's done by a community member. Um, I'm really looking forward to playing with it because it takes away that three-way replication and brings down the 200% overhead of capacity down to 25%. We're also doing tiering and SSD integration. Um, Snap is coming really soon, and uh, we'll continue to do lots of deeper cloud integration. Okay, um, I uh, think I'll leave this on the screen in case anybody wants to write it down, and if there's any questions before I run out of time, I'll take them. Okay, no questions. So I'm just going to go say thank you, and it was uh, nice being in Denver. <laughs>